News is the first draft of history. It is immediate and takes place in real time. Legends take longer to develop and are sometimes based on myth. This Fox News series looks at the truth behind the legend. Previously on Legends and Lies, The Patriots. There are two things I cannot abide. Deserters and rebels. Our dead brethren were cruelly and villainously massacred. Ever since Lexington and Concord, all of America is at war. Dr. Franklin. Good God. I hereby propose that this Congress appoint as its commander Colonel George Washington of Virginia. You ask what I need, Dr. Franklin. I need everything, or this war will be over before it even begins. Colonel Glover, I understand they captured one of our scouts. Aye, the lad was trying to slip into the city to gather intelligence. Now they have him trussed up for all to see. Shots from one of the guns, Your Excellency. That's playing into their hand. Will His Excellency have us stand by and do nothing? General Green, any man who attempts to approach the British lines without orders, arrest him and clap him in irons. Pushed to their limits by an oppressive empire, a determined group of rebels unites under the cause of liberty. Their quest for freedom will unify a people, ignite a revolution, and forge a new system of government. In time, these brave men and women will come to be known as the American Patriots. General George Washington, the very embodiment of American ideals. A commander of men who will win a war, lead a nation, and claim its rightful place in the world. But behind every commander lies a man, and behind every legend lies the truth. Attention, battery! George Washington may become the father of our country, but when the revolution begins, Washington is far from the man, legend says, is born to lead. Following a disastrous performance in the French and Indian War, Washington is turned down for a royal appointment with the British Army. The rebuke leaves him unsure of his own ability to lead. As the Continental Army faces the British Army in Boston, George Washington doesn't just have a war to win. He has something to prove to his men, his new enemy, and to himself. This army killed over 200 redcoats at Bunker Hill. When London gets word, it's only a matter of time before General Gage is finished in America. Only Dr. Franklin and his 
congressional delegation could be convinced our own condition is any better. Franklin had come down to Boston to see the condition of the troops that George Washington had taken over. They were part of a commission that were sent to Boston to report back to Congress. As an untested commander and an outsider from Virginia, Washington must convince his senior officers he's ready to lead. Who does this planter think he is? <clears throat> General Lee. General Ward. The condition of this army is a disgrace. You both have much to do in teaching your men proper discipline. Yes, Your Excellency. See to it, then. General Putnam, a word, if you will. Yes, Your Excellency. Tell me, General Putnam, what of our provisions and supplies? There's not much in the way of uniforms or blankets. And what of our powder supply? Less than half a pound per man. Good God, keep your voice low. Half a pound per man? This army wouldn't last five minutes if Gage launches an attack. I am truly sensible of the high honor done to me and disappointment. Yet, I feel great distress from a consciousness that my abilities and military experience may not be equal to the extensive and important trust. Well then, we shall make munitions our first priority. Washington thinks I've been chosen. This is what I must do. But on the other hand, maybe I'm not good enough. That thought terrifies him. He says, from this moment, I date the ruin of my reputation. Washington's inexperienced army is another source of fear, one he must eliminate quickly. Is the health King George? Colonel Glover, what is the penalty for insubordination? 39 lashes, sir. Have this man arrested. Put the rest of these marbleheaders of yours to digging latrines. Camp reeks. The Marbleheaders are a group of mariners named for their militia commander's hometown, Marblehead, Massachusetts. They're a rowdy group who aren't afraid to remind Washington they're uncommitted volunteers. But this is just the beginning of a long and valuable commitment they'll make to their general, leading Washington in an amazing escape from Long Island and in a daring Christmas night mission across the frozen Delaware River. When Washington was appointed commanding general of the Continental Army, he had to instill discipline. He had to instill a notion of respect within the confines of this Continental Army. Sorry, lad. Leadership requires discipline as well. General Lee? Dr. Franklin, I think I've seen enough. His attempts to instill a kind of respect by asking them to refer to him as Your Excellency backfires. And so he resorts to corporal punishment, which does send a much firmer message. But that's not the Washington we think about. Lack of discipline is just one of Washington's problems. Without enough artillery or gunpowder, his army's attempt to surround Boston and Charlestown, starving out the British, will eventually be overwhelmed. Ben Franklin's congressional delegation is also watching his every move. Gentlemen, Congress is impatient about the stalemate. When I took command of this army, I expected to find a force of 20,000 men. Instead, we have less than 15,000, a quarter of which are sick. Now that said, with the addition of Morgan's riflemen, we may yet be able to launch an attack. 
And what does His Excellency propose? A direct assault on Boston, gentlemen. Our men could cross the back bay in flat bottom boats and attack the British. Yes, Boston is simply too well defended. The British suffer greatly for want of provisions. Their spirits are broken. And there sits Boston, gentlemen. We must attack. Just as long as we have arms and ammunition, sir. General Washington, uh, may we have a word? Washington has a pension for grand plans. He wants to assault across water and take the city of Boston in urban warfare. And Franklin says, no. <laughs> Do something you can handle. How bad is it? We have but 36 barrels of gunpowder. A few shots per man. The American colonies can't produce gunpowder. 90% of the gunpowder used in the revolution had to be brought in from someplace else. There was no army supply system. This is pre-industrial revolution. Nothing in America is mass produced at that point in time. You must keep this to yourself and a few trusted officers. We must be wary of traitors, General. Spies oh, everywhere. Who, in God's name, is shooting those weapons? Those Virginians, no doubt. About 400 yards, I'd say. Washington's army are guys that don't necessarily see each other as one and the same. He's got Dan Morgan's riflemen from Virginia. He's got the, the Marblehead men, oh, these fishermen from Massachusetts, and they don't like each other. Right in the frying pan. Hold your fire. Damn fools will bring on a bombardment for sure. There's no Massachusetts or Virginia in this army. This is an American army. There was no tradition of an American army. Nothing like it had existed on American soil before. Why would volunteers from Massachusetts heed the orders of a Virginia officer? Get down! He had to embody this idea of a coherent American people and nation. George Washington knows better than anyone how vulnerable the Continental Army really is. His mission is a delicate and dangerous one, to build a formidable force without drawing the British into battle before he's ready. It's a difficult task for an uncertain general. 